Curse should work. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, th thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, my name is Noam Shazir from uh, Google Brain, and uh, I, I want to talk to you about some work we've been doing, uh, which is a new uh, language which we call Mesh TensorFlow. And the idea is that uh, we would like uh, to uh, distribute tensor computations across. Uh, large meshes of processors. In particular, we've been building these uh, uh, TPU pods, uh, which are these supercomputers, which are great for deep learning. And uh, we want to do not only data parallelism, uh, which is uh, splitting a batch, but splitting models as well. And I will come later to why. So uh, things we'd like to be able to implement are data parallelism, which is boring. It's what everybody does uh, already, and you don't need mesh TensorFlow. But more excitingly, uh, we want to do model parallelism, which means we want to split the network ex itself across uh, processors. Uh, but we might also want to split uh, uh, an image across processors. We might want to combine all these things. And I will motivate this in a little bit. Um, and uh, what hardware are we thinking of? Uh, anything where you have a network of similar pr processors, each one with a local memory. And uh, what we uh, have at Google is these, uh, uh, these meshes of uh, TPUs, but uh, e equally useful is for uh, multi-GPU machines, uh, et cetera. Um, OK, so why do we care about this? I care because I want to build giant models. Uh, giant neural networks are awesome. They're uh, better quality. And unfortunately, they don't fit on one processor. So you can't just use data parallelism and put the whole thing on every processor. Um, and model parallelism, as I'll mention later, is uh, very tricky to implement uh, well, uh, especially when you have a giant network. And, uh, and we'll get to that. So um, my favorite uh, domain is language modeling. Uh, for one, there's an infinite number, uh, uh, almost infinite amount of data available. Just crawl the web and uh, predict it. Um, models, uh, bigger models work a lot better. And in fact, you really only have to train one model, uh, according to some uh, recent work at OpenAI, that you can train a big language model and specialize it to get state-of-the-art performance on a, a whole bunch of different tasks. Uh, so it all points to let's train a, a huge model. So uh, as some examples, uh, I, I think the OpenAI language model was something like a 150 million parameters. So I trained a, a model about that size on this billion word language modeling benchmark and told it to randomly generate text starting with according to Ray Kurzweil. And um, it, it's clearly grammatical, but there are some pretty big shortcomings in understanding of the world, et cetera. As far as I know, the University of California, Berkeley, does not have a musical economics department uh, as of yet. Um, so, uh, but if you make the same model a lot bigger by increasing the sizes of the layers, et cetera, um, here's a similar model with 5 billion parameters. Again, uh, random generation starting with according to Ray Kurzweil. And it seems to know a heck of a lot more about, uh, about the world. Um, anyway, so uh, having motivated that, um, we want to train giant models. One problem is just computation. Generally, you, you've got the, the amount of computation you need is quadratic in the number of parameters because you want to, there's more computation per training example, and you want to run more training examples to train your model. Uh, say you want to train a billion parameter model on a billion words, you can probably do that in about a day on our cloud TPU, which uh, should be accessible to most people. But if you want like a hundred billion parameter model on a hundred billion tokens, and you want to tra train it in a week or so, you're going to need some kind of giant supercomputer with uh, which can do like a hundred petaflops. Um, but if you're Google, you just build supercomputers. Um, that's that's our solution. Um, Another option is uh, to use sparsity so that you don't have to scale up the computation uh, as you're scaling up the number of parameters. Um, we've got some solutions for that as well. Anyway, we should be able to train some huge models that, that are really awesome. But the, big pr the next big problem is memory constraints. 
uh, what, what almost everyone does for training neural networks is you do something called data parallelism, which means you're replicating all the parameters on every processor and splitting the training batch across all processors. But really what we need to do for a big model is split the model it itself um, with different parameters or different layers or different parts of layers across uh, on different processors. Um, the way you can do model parallelism now is assign different operations to different processors. Um, it's, it's tricky. You have to figure out some different algorithm for every different network you have, and it creates these giant graphs that are very irritating to work with. Um, OK, so let's look at what works really well with data parallelism. Um, the way we do data parallelism on our TPU pods is you replicate the parameters on every core. You split the batch across all the cores, use a giant batch, and then run the forward pass, run the backward pass, and add up the gradients across all the cores, put the result everywhere, and do the updates everywhere. Um, this works really well because the only communication is this MPI all reduce, which happens to be really fast on locally connected networks. And so what works well is, with data parallelism is it's universal. It's fast to compile because you actually can write one program and run the same program on every processor. Um, you, you get full utilization, basically, uh, there, you know, since everyone's doing the same thing. And this uh, all-reduce operation is all you need, and it's really fast. But unfortunately, uh, you've got to fit all the parameters on every core. So that's not going to work. So we, uh, we're writing this new language called Mesh TensorFlow. Uh, actually, it's implemented. You can use it. Um, and it's inspired by this what works well with data parallelism in that every operation in every tensor is going to be split across all processors, either replicated or, or, or split, that is. And you're running the same program on every processor, sort of a SIMD kind of uh, programming, and it uses uh, collective communication like all reduce. OK, so how does this work? Well, in data parallelism, you're splitting the batch dimension, which means any tensor that has a batch dimension, meaning activations, gets split across all the processors, and a tensor that does not have a batch dimension, meaning your weights, is replicated across all the processors. Now, with model parallelism, you're, you'll do something similar, but you'll be splitting other dimensions. Instead of splitting the batch dimension, you may be splitting the depths of hidden layers. So that's what our language is going to let you do. Uh, and where is the communication going to happen? Well, most operations, just like data parallelism, will not require communication because every processor will be operating on its own local slices. But some operations will require communication, particularly when you're doing a matrix multiply where the inner dimension is split. You'll end up doing a MPI all reduce. Uh, just like in data parallelism, uh, you, you end up with that inner dimension being split when you're computing the parameter gradients. OK, so let's do an example. We have uh, just a simple perceptron with three layers, in, uh, you know, input, hidden, and output layers. In the data parallelism um, configuration, the, uh, the batch dimension is split, so the activations are all split, but the weight matrices are replicated. But instead, you could do model parallelism by saying we're going to split the depth of this hidden layer, uh, d sub h, and now you end up with, the, with uh, x and y, the input and output, fully replicated, but now the weight matrices and the hidden layer are split across that dimension, d sub h, and you end up with uh, all reduce operations when, for that second forward matrix multiply when you're reducing out that hidden dimension. Um, alternatively, you could have s decided to split the input and output dimensions, um, and you get a different configuration of splitting and replicating. And in fact, you could, you could split a lot of stuff. Say we have a big three-dimensional mesh of processors. We'll split the batch across one dimension of the mesh, the hidden layer across the second dimension, and the input and output layers across the third dimension. Now every matrix in the uh, computation is tiled two ways. We've got all reduce operations all over the place, but the thing will actually run well in mesh TensorFlow if you have a nice three-dimensional mesh of processors. Um, OK, so what's the mesh TensorFlow language like? It's almost like TensorFlow, except 
now all of your tensor dimensions have to have names as, as well as, as sizes. So you name all of the tensor dimensions so you can specify which tensor dimensions are split across which dimensions of the mesh. A mesh is just a, uh, you know, an abstraction representing an n-dimensional array of processors. And you have this layout which tells you uh, what tensor dimensions get split across what uh, mesh dimensions. You build this thing in uh, Python, and it uh, compiles into TensorFlow. Um, so for example, for this perceptron, it, it looks a lot like TensorFlow code, except that you put uh, dimensions on all of the, uh, you put names on all the dimensions. Uh, you use Einstein summation, in, in, which is a very cool generalization of matrix multiplication. Uh, it's particularly convenient if the dimensions are named. And then here we have a uh, mesh that's an eight by eight uh, mesh of processors, and we're going to split the batch dimension across rows of processors and the hidden dimension across columns of processors, um, and you'd write it something like that. Um, we've also done this for our transformer machine translation and language model. You can actually do a very nice model parallel version of that if you split the uh, vocabulary, the attention heads, and the feed forward dimension across all processors. And in fact, you can split the batch across an, uh, another dimension of the mesh, uh, which is what we, we've done to uh, run on our two-dimensional TPU pods. Um, and it's not quite as easy as, as, as I said. Um, like, there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, thought that needs to go into picking a good layout because you want to make sure that all of the expensive computations are split and not replicated. So you want to make sure that, that every uh, expensive matrix multiplication should be split across the mesh. Uh, you cannot split two dimensions of the same tensor across the same mesh dimension. And you want to make sure you're splitting dimensions into fairly large chunks to, uh, to maximize the ratio of computation to communication. Um, so, uh, so, so far, we've scaled up our transformer models over giant TPU pods. Um, uh, that was the results I was showing you in the beginning of the, uh, uh, the talk with uh, that, that, that model was trained for about a day on, uh, on a giant 512-core uh, uh, pod. We got like over 50% uh, utilization on the thing. And, uh, We've got state-of-the-art results on language modeling, machine translation, and we're trying to now scale things up with the mixture of experts to train really incredibly large models. Um, and th this isn't the only reason you need mesh TensorFlow. Uh, you also might want to have low latency inference, which you can get if you're dividing up the computation across multiple processors. Uh, another possible application is that you have some giant inputs, like a big uh, image, and you won't, can't fit it on one core, so you want to split the spatial dimensions across, uh, uh, across a large um, array of processors. Um, and the current status is that it runs on, uh, on cloud CPU, it runs uh, on uh, GPU and CPU. Um, we've got it open sourced. Um, we're work, working hard on, uh, on improving it, and uh, we, uh, we're going to have a paper out soon. Any questions? All right. That was great. Interesting to note that um, TensorFlow was actually announced at BayLearn. It wasn't called TensorFlow because I think the actual announcement was the, the next day, but three years ago at BayLearn. So this is a great wow. follow-up <laughs> to that. Um, are there any questions? So uh, is it really hard to automatically do model parallelism given, like, say, you have, like, 32 uh, TPUs or GPUs? Is, is it learnable? Oh, oh, learnable as to how to pick which dimensions to split. No, uh, 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 how no. to distribute the entire model across all, all the available compute. Oh, okay. Um, well, so, so uh, mesh TensorFlow is sort of a language for specifying how it's distributed. So if you read a mesh TensorFlow program, uh, you know, that, that, that will, uh, that's all you need to do, and, uh, and that will happen. But, you know, choosing how you want to distribute the thing, uh, that's still a human problem, but it seems like a clear 
uh, you know, uh, area of research for the future as to how to automatically figure out how to distribute the thing. Okay. okay. Thank you. And one more question. Have you, have you studied usage of this on topologies other than meshes, say trees, stars, strings? Oh, um, well, uh, for topologies other than meshes, you could certainly view it as a uh, as uh, one-dimensional mesh, uh, you know, the flat, the flat uh, array. But no, no, I have not. Uh, we have not uh, thought about that yet. All right, time for the last question. Yeah. Um, so, assuming uh, I attempt implementing this somewhere, what would be your inputs for the debugging part? Because if uh, debugging this looks really messy. So your insights on the debugging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see. So uh, debugging it, well, I guess for uh, correctness, you, you can try a small example on your local machine, um, you know, just to make sure it runs. But for figuring out the performance, you know, we, we do have, uh, you know, pro profiling tools for cloud TPU, et cetera. So you can see how much time it's spending, uh, you know, doing various uh, matrix multiplies versus uh, the, uh, the all reduce operations, uh, you know, uh, so, so you can tell, uh, kind of debug the performance. Uh, so an extension question. Do you like see uh, errors because of latencies? Like, uh, uh, or, latencies. Or that is kind of taken care of. Right, uh, mostly latencies uh, haven't been a problem. It's, it's more just uh, network bandwidth um, because generally, uh, you know, if, uh, if you ha uh, to get a pretty good throughput, you want to have rather large batches. So the tensor is being sent around at, at least, uh, you know, for the hardware we've been working on, uh, bandwidth is more an issue than latency. Thank you so much. Right. Excellent. Let's give Noam a hand. Thank you.